we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study here in the Gospel of Luke. We'll begin reading together at verse 31. We'll read to verse 35, and then we'll move on into verse 36 and conclude at verse 50. So let's begin here in Luke chapter 7 at verse 31, and I will read to verse 35 when we'll get into our study. Luke writes in chapter 7, verse 31, the Lord said, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We mourned to you, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. What the Lord Jesus Christ is dealing with in the passage before us is criticism and judgment. You see, he has just confirmed the ministry of John the Baptist, and he now has to address a growing attitude of this critical spirit and judgmental heart and, and all. And so that's what he begins to do in verse 31. Now, as he begins in verse 31, he uses a common teaching technique. Uh, the way he begins when he says, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation and what are they like, is actually a common technique used during this time to introduce a parable or some other illustration. And so that's what he's about to do. And so he begins to do so by pointing out that there's a generation that is having a certain response to his work and his word. And so he says, how can I compare this generation? What is this unbelieving generation like? To what can I compare it? And he says they're like, like, like children who object to everything that their playmates want to do. He says they're like, in verse 32, children sitting in the marketplace. These children are spoken of as being in the agora or the marketplace. And so while the, the parents are going about on their business, the children obviously would find something to do and they would play with other children. And what he's mentioning here when he speaks in verse 32 of playing the flute for you and you didn't dance or mourning to you and you didn't weep, those were common children's games during the time of Christ, what we today might say playing wedding or playing funeral. That's what they were doing. Those are games at that time. And so his point is nothing that's done is ever satisfactory for them. There, there's always something wrong, and it causes a, a dissatisfaction for them because some people can never see any good in anything. And so these are unsatisfied, fickle people is the point he's making. And so when he says, let me liken it unto children playing in the marketplace, common games, but they're unsatisfied as they play together. And he uses that to illustrate John the Baptist. Notice verse 33, for John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said he has a demon. So Jesus applies the first portion of his illustration to the people's reaction to John. We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. See, he's saying John came neither eating nor drinking. He, he led an austere lifestyle. John did not live in a lavish way. He was known for his spiritual discipline. Uh, Matthew tells us in chapter 3, verse 4, concerning him that his clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts, wild honey. So that caused people problem. And so their responses for him was, well, this man's austere lifestyle really speaks concerning the fact that he's got a demon, which in some ways that term, he's got a demon, is another way of saying he's crazy. This guy's crazy the way that he lives. So his, his discipline, the discipline of his godly lifestyle caused them problems because normally when somebody's sold out, the discipline of their lifestyle can cause carnal people problems. That's just normal. They said that kind of thing about Jesus in Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. When Jesus entered a house, a crowd gathered. His disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about this, they went, and went to take charge of him. They said, he's out of his mind. When, when somebody is serving uh, the Lord God with all that's within them, there will always be people who see their discipline as a sign of them being overly zealous or too fanatic or a bit crazy. I remember a woman calling our church years ago now who was very upset because her son had, had come here and actually had gotten saved. And she said, you know, I could handle him when he was loaded. I can't handle him as a Jesus freak. 
She preferred him to be a, a lodi and a drunk. She, she said, I can handle that, but I don't like what he's become. And there are quite a number of people who think just like that. And so the witness of John's devotion convicted those who saw him. And they couldn't remain simply spectators. They were convicted by his commitment. John wouldn't dance to their tune, so he's got to be crazy. And then he gives a second illustration which applies to Jesus. In verse 34, he says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. You say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, Jesus lived a normal pattern of the average Jewish man. He ate and he drank like others did. His failing to them, well, he's not devoted enough. Now, the bottom line is very simply this. If you want to find fault, you can find fault with anyone. You can even find fault with Jesus Christ himself. If you want to, if you want to inspect sin closely enough, or if you want to think that people who don't agree with the things that you do are very sinful, and you can find something wrong with God himself. And that's what was taking place here. They said that Jesus Christ wasn't devoted, and yet John was, but he's crazy. So what's Jesus' response? Verse 35, wisdom is justified by all her children. The fruit of the Pharisees and the way that they think, and the way that they act, well, their fruit can be compared to the fruit that's produced by the ministry of Jesus Christ. And when you compare the loving, compassionate, merciful touch of God in somebody's life that transforms them into loving, compassionate, and merciful people, when you compare the touch of God in somebody's life with religious legalism from the Pharisees' perspective who may have been able to, uh, to um, comb the world to make one uh, follower of their particular lifestyle but making them twice the child of hell that they themselves are, when they would change somebody's life. It wasn't for the better. It was always for the worse. Jesus said, just check out the children or look at the fruit, and you're going to be able to make a judge as to whether or not, judgment as to whether or not my ministry is good and from God or not. And so, moving into verse 36, continuing, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Teacher, say it. There was a, a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But... To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is uh, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. For some reason... And I'm not quite sure why. I'm attracted to sinful women. Just look at Marie. No, I'm a jack. <laughs> she didn't hear that. Don't tell her. No, I, I, I see women in the Bible that are touched by the grace of God, and for some reason that speaks to my heart very, very deeply. It does. 
We have a woman at the well, a woman who had had five men that she called husband and a man she was living with. And I'm attracted to the grace of God as God shows her such wonderful grace. I think of the woman who was caught in sexual sin and, and, and dragged before Jesus Christ in front of witnesses and how she was treated and, and Jesus' response paraphrased when he says, um, the one here who has no sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. I, I'm, I'm attracted to, to God's mercy, I guess. And, and because, uh, because I, I, frankly, I take the side of those women when I see how they're being treated and, 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 and it moves my heart, uh, I have found uh, three women in the New Testament that actually have had tremendous impact in that way. And this happens to be one of those chapters that, that gives us one of those instances. This is the woman who is a great sinner, a notorious sinner. And so what we see here is we see Simon, a Pharisee, we see a sinner, and we see a Savior. We see those three here in this one story. We see Simon, we see a sinner, and we see a Savior. And as we look at this, what we're really seeing is Jesus Christ once again being presented to us as the forgiver of sins. And when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to ask yourself, what is the motivator of his forgiveness? And one of the chief motivators of his forgiveness of our sins is simply his great love for us, his great love for us. Now, how do we know that? Well, the Bible makes that clear in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, because there uh, Paul said, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. And so we see Jesus as the forgiver of sins. And that's what we're going to be seeing here in this passage. Now notice how it says in verse 36 that, that one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. I've mentioned this to you before. Perhaps you're new at reading the Bible. The word Pharisee there literally means separated one. That's what the word sep uh, Pharisee means, the separated ones. The Pharisees were a small religious group with tremendous influence. Um, uh, historians state that they numbered somewhere around 6,000, with the majority of them uh, occupying positions in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, they had a tremendous amount of influence during the time of Jesus Christ. There were two main religious groups uh, during the time of Jesus that you'll read when you read in the Bible. You'll read of them. You, you read of the Pharisees and you read of the Sadducees. The Sadducees and the Pharisees have uh, contrasting histories. Um, Sadducees basically began uh, about 150 or so years before Christ. And uh, the Sadducees were really what you would call a Hellenized or Grecianized or paganized Jews who basically had combined uh, the uh, Greek philosophy with Jewish theology and, and therefore did a kind of a hybrid faith that uh, was very much culturally attuned to their times. And so they denied things like spirits, angels, they denied the resurrection and all. They were the, what we would today probably say were the liberals in the religious camp. Now, the Pharisees, on the other hand, would have been the extreme conservatives, uh, they were the ones who were the separated ones because when the, when the uh, Sadducees began to, to become uh, more known and all and to have great influence, well, the Pharisees made sure that they, that they um, separated from that. And so at first, their, their origin was, was not necessarily bad in and of itself. They wanted to keep pure in the things of God. But over time, they were hardened into their traditions and, and ultimately um, lost the real purpose of being separated to God because they stopped loving people. They, they stopped seeing people as important and all, and, and their rules and their regulations began to dominate. And that's why, that's why they very often will be in conflict with Christ. That's why they get upset at Him for healing on the Sabbath because for them, the concern over somebody's health was not as great as the keeping of their understanding of the law. And, and if Jesus did a work on the Sabbath, then He ought to be stoned for doing so because that's a blasphemous thing to do because you're breaking God's law and you're teaching others to do it. And, and so from their perspective, uh, they were right and Jesus was wrong. Now, Simon is a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, he's a conservative religious man. 
And he's invited Jesus Christ to dinner. Now, I want you to see how it says in verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked him. Now, the word asked, when you look at the New Testament, the New Testament is written in the Greek language. The word is koine Greek, koine speaking of the common language during the time. So when you look at this, the New Testament being Greek, you look into the word asked there, and you can actually find that that's a strong Greek word that literally means to beg or to compel. In other words, this was not just a simple request. It wasn't like you were talking to one of your friends and you said, you know, we ought to grab some lunch sometime. Because we can do that. You can see one of the friends you have here at church and you'll say, you know what, I haven't talked to you for a while, you know, next week. Why don't we get together if you're able to? You know, we do that all the time. This isn't what he's doing. What he's doing is he's begging him. He's insisting. He's pleading. He's saying, I want you to come, and I won't take no for an answer. So this is the attitude that you find here with this man by the name of Simon. Simon really wants Jesus to come. But you know what? He doesn't have to beg him to do that because Luke has already revealed that Jesus is willing to spend time with people, and yet Simon's insistent that he comes to his home for a meal. Now, many people want to know, what would be the motivation of this? Why would Simon compel him? Why would Simon beg him, insist, demand? Why would he want him to come to his house? There are various reasons, perhaps. One could be curiosity. Why would he invite him? Maybe he had curiosity. Jesus' fame has touched him. And perhaps what that has done is it's it's caused him to be curious about Jesus and and to want to know uh, something about him. And so if I invite him over to my house to have a meal with me, I'll have an opportunity to speak to him and gain some information. I'm curious about him. And you know what? The Lord uses curiosity. He does it all the time. I've spoken to you about this before. I've shared with you how people can get saved in the, the most odd ways. Uh, and and uh, years ago when we were having a, uh, an Easter service here, a woman was uh, driving by. And that, on Sunday, she's driving by, and she sees the cars that are, are you know, backed up and, and pulling in, and, and she's not from around here, so... She pulls into line, you know. Some people just have to get into lines. And, and she, she, she pulls into the line, and, and she goes up to the front gate over here, and, and uh, she asks one of our, our, our guys there, is this a yard sale? She thought she was going to a yard sale. And, and the guy goes, no, no, no. This isn't a yard sale. It's a church service. She says, oh, it's a church. He said, yeah, yeah. And she said, oh, really? Yeah, you had a, you had a park. And, she, and go on in and hear what's being said. And, and you know, she did. And when I gave the invitation, she came forward. So she came out of curiosity, thinking she was going to a yard sale, and ended up going to the kingdom of God. You know, and that, God uses curiosity, you know. Um, remember in, in, um, in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, remember a man by the name of Nicodemus, how that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do the works that thou doest unless God is with him. See, he came to Jesus by night to speak to him because he was concerned and curious about the things that Jesus was doing. And and Jesus at that time was able to lead him into the kingdom. So curiosity, yes, possibly. How about courtesy? Could it be simple courtesy? Because it was a Jewish custom at that time to invite visiting rabbis. And it's possible that just out of, uh, out of courtesy, he invited Jesus to his house. And again, some people get saved out of courtesy. That's how I got saved. A friend of mine said to me, I've invited you to go here. You can't say no. And out of courtesy, I went with him, and I got saved that day. Courtesy? How about collecting celebrities? There are people who do that, you know. They want to know the up-and-coming person. And because he's a religious individual, it's very possible that he wanted to collect this new rabbi as one of his, uh, his, his friends and all. Because some people, some people like to drop names. Some people like to speak concerning the people that they know. A lot of people become popular by extension by simply saying, oh, yes, I have a friend who is this way or is this person. And they borrow the status. It's possible that he was a collector of celebrities. But I, I think that it was criticism. I think that he invited Jesus over so that he could find something about him, so that he could say something about him. We've already seen this in in chapter 6. We saw it in verse 7, in Luke 6, verse 7, where it says, The scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find accusation against him. 
I suspect, and, and I, I, think, uh, I think so rightly, as we see this is going to pan out in just a moment, that he actually had him there that he might criticize him. Some people look for opportunity to criticize. I have it here all the time. It's just the way churches are. People will come and they'll find something they don't like. They'll find something that they just... I've had people, you know, say the oddest things, and, and over time I've discovered that some people simply do like to criticize. They, they don't like conviction, and therefore they're going to find something wrong uh, uh, with, with the church, and that happens quite often, and that's pretty much normal criticism. I've told you this before. I wasn't going to share it because I've said it to you more than once, but I'll say it again because it's one of my stories that I kind of like, so I repeat the ones I like, frankly. How that I had gone to buy a, a van, and, and the car salesman was sitting in the passenger seat as I was driving, and, and my kids were in the back, and Marie was in the back seat as this car salesman's next to me, and, and I drive off the lot there, and as I'm driving the van, wanting to know whether or not I have an ability to buy a van, he asks me, what do you do for a living? And any, any time somebody asks me that question, I just kind of, you know, okay, here we go. Let's see what he does. And so I said, I'm a pastor. Now, let's see. And he, he thinks for a moment. I'm sure he was selecting his words carefully. And he says, oh, you're a pastor. Pastors are thieves. <laughs> I wondered how he knew me. You know? <laughs> Yeah, he says, pastors are thieves. <laughs> and I'm driving, I'm thinking, that's not going to make a sale. I mean, calling me a thief, I mean, what an odd thing to say. I mean, I got my family in the, in the van, and, and you're telling me I'm a thief? And I just, how odd is this? And so I'm just driving, and, and, and yeah, pastors are thieves. And I looked at him. I said, they are. And he goes, yes. So he's pretty sure I was a thief. And I go, well, I said to him, do you know that there are 500,000 pastors in the United States? He said, no, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, and I guarantee you the overwhelming majority of them are honest, God-fearing men who love the Lord, and they're not thieves. He goes, well, you may be right. I said, yeah. And I'm quietly driving, and I turned to him, and I said, you know, the last three cars that I bought were sold to me by lying car salesmen. <laughs> I said, but you're not a lying car salesman, are you? You're honest, aren't you? He goes, yes, sir, I am. And I said, good, and I'm an honest pastor. It's nice to meet you. You know, some people will, will just, they just look to criticize, and, and they do, and they don't know you from, from Adam, but they're going to criticize. I suspect that that's what's taking place here. I suspect that he brought the Lord Jesus there to find something wrong with him, and you'll see why in just a moment. Now, in verse 37, he goes on and says, Behold. Now, when he says, and behold, that word behold there is to cause us to, to uh, see that this is unusual. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. And so, women at that time were normally not present at this kind of a meal. And the fact that she was well known, and as a matter of fact, he simply speaks of her as being a sinner. When he says this woman who is a sinner, she's a notorious sinner, and uh, she's a prostitute. And what has happened is this prostitute has entered the home uninvited. Interestingly enough, notice with me that she remains unnamed. It doesn't say her name, though she was well known. Everybody knew who she was. Now, Luke could have said the woman's name. He could have said, and whatever her name was, walked into the room. I, I love the grace of God because he doesn't want this woman to be remembered for her past sins. That's why she's left unnamed. Because her name should be protected because her sins have been washed away. 
And so she's an unnamed woman there protecting her because this story has been read now for 2,000 years. But God doesn't want her to be remembered because of her sins, because her sins have been dealt with. The psalmist in Psalm 103, verses 11 through 13 says, As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And so God has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. If I start on an, at the equator on a globe and I start going north, I eventually hit the apex, I'm north, and then I eventually come back and I go down south. But if I go from the east to the west, it doesn't matter. The east and the west will never, ever touch because I start out east and I'll always go east. If I start out west, I'll always go west. And so he doesn't say as far as the north is from the south. He says as far as the east is from the west to give us an attitude or an idea of infinity. God will separate our sins from us for and they'll never be remembered again. Now, this woman must have been impressed with Jesus' approachable, compassionate ministry. She saw his mercy. It's very, very possible that she had heard how he had eaten with Levi, Matthew, Levi, and his friends, because Luke has already said in chapter 5 uh, that uh, people had spoken concerning that, and the question had been asked, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, those who do well, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's very possible that she's heard of this one who is merciful and compassionate. The thing that I love about Jesus so very much, though I have to be honest with you, is that he is approachable. He's approachable. Now, Jesus, as a typical Jew would be at during that day, is reclining at meal. They would recline at low couches. They would rest on their left elbow, stretched away from the table, and with the right hand would take and eat from the table. And so the sandals that are normally worn have been removed and his feet are stretched out. Now, as typical of Jewish women, and you see this with this woman here, she has, in verse 37, an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. And so as typical of Jewish women, there was a, a, a flask of perfume that's hanging around her neck. And so she approaches Jesus, and as she begins to walk towards him, she begins to sob convulsively. Now, obviously, every one of us, when we go to restaurants and all, every one of us know that there's that, that, that table noise, that the talking all around you. It's, it's just, you know, that's the way it is. People are talking, and usually it'll, it'll rise for a while, and then it's low and rises. And so there's table noise, conversation going on. But I can't help but believe that as she enters into this space where they're eating, that people begin to notice that she's coming in. One, it's a woman, and two, she's a notorious sinner. And, and so this is highly unusual, and people begin to get quiet as she walks in. And as she's walking in, you can almost hear the, uh, the conversational noise dying down to to no noise at all, and now it's dead silent. And ask yourself how you would feel if you were walking into a room with people speaking, and the moment you step in, everything is silent. Every eye is upon you, and that's what's taking place. And so she's looking around the room for the place where the, the guest of honor would be, and she sees Jesus there. And as she sees him, she just breaks. And the tears begin to flow, and they begin to just pour out of her eyes, and she's standing over the Lord Jesus Christ, and as she's standing over him sobbing, the tears that have formed are now beginning to drip off of her chin, and, and she sees them as, as they are now dripping onto his feet, and as she sees them dripping onto his feet, she sees the dust and, and the moisture now that, that it is making it obvious that his feet are still dusty, and as a result of that, she bends down, and as she bends down, her hair is undone, and she reaches out, and she begins to take her hair, and she begins to wipe the feet of her master, and as she does so, the love that she has is so overwhelming that she begins to kiss his feet in, in submitted obedience obedient love for him, and it's a pure love that she has for Jesus. But Simon doesn't think so, because she's a prostitute. And what he sees her doing, frankly, is plying her trade. And as he sees her doing that, it disturbs him. You know, sometimes, sometimes churches have to beg 
people to serve. We, we, don't, we don't believe that that's necessary. We don't beg people to serve. You want to know why? We don't have to. Because when people are in love with the Lord, they find ways to serve. They want to serve when you love the Lord. You know, you can always beg people, and there will always be somebody who, as a result of being asked or begged, will do something. But the purest worship and the purest service is from the heart of gratitude, and that's what you see here. You see this woman humbling herself. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He'll lift you up. And you see her kissing and, and anointing Jesus' feet with that fragrant oil because it's revealing, once again, her love for him, her gratitude. Uh, I remember when, when Jesus healed uh, the mother-in-law of the apostle Peter. It's recorded in Mark chapter 1, verse 31. How the Bible says that when Jesus healed her, uh, she served them. And that's what happens when the Lord reaches you and, and touches you. Now, Simon is there, and, and notice the Bible in verse 39 says... Uh, when, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, uh, saying, um, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him. She's a sinner. Any blind man can see what she is. It, you don't have to be a prophet to see this and understand this. You know, in, you, know you can... There are places that, that I have traveled... And I'll be walking on my way somewhere, and there'll be prostitutes, and you'll see them. They don't wear signs. You know, hi, I'm a prostitute. They don't wear signs, but do you know they're prostitutes? They might call out to you. They'll make overtures to you. They'll, they'll walk in front of you. I mean, that has happened in my life. Numerous times I've seen prostitutes. Uh, you know, of course, I guess every adult has seen people who have given themselves. It, it, you know, it, it, and that's, that's what he's saying. He's saying if this man were a prophet, he'd know who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him. She's a sinner. I mean, it's real obvious that this person that is touching him. Now, remember, Pharisees, separated ones, do not want to be touched by the unclean. As a matter of fact, according to Jewish law, if somebody who is not kosher or somebody who is ceremonially unclean touches you, you become unclean too. And so they're watching that and they're saying, now the only reason that Jesus doesn't mind this woman touching him is because he's unclean himself. And that's how rigid he is and, and that's how he's thinking. He, I've heard that this man is a prophet, <laughs> but this is obvious proof that he's not. It's interesting to me that Simon's thought is revealed because notice how it says in verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. He's not saying this out loud. This isn't something that's being recorded. This is something that the Lord told his apostles later on. What he was thinking is this. Now, as that's taken place, um, Simon's thoughts have been revealed to Jesus and, and also to us. And, and so in verse 40, Jesus answered. <laughs> even though the guy wasn't speaking to him. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. <laughs> and he said, teacher, say it. Now, when you read this and you just read, teacher, say it, it just seems like a natural flow, right? In reality, that's a very, a very rude response to Jesus Christ. He was being short with him. Say it. That's what he's doing. It, it, it's like... He's so disgusted, he doesn't even want to talk to the man. So it's like, you know, that's the attitude of Simon. Say it. What do you want to say? Now, Jesus begins to minister. And he does so through a story. A certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore... Which of them will love him the most? Who loves him more? You see, when Jesus begins to speak about that, he speaks about real-life situations. You know, Simon is so caught up with outer appearance that he doesn't see the heart of people because outer appearance doesn't always reveal the heart. You know, it, it's, it to me is kind of funny to even use illustrations like this because it's so far removed from so many people. 
in our congregation as people who, who are, are younger people who wouldn't even understand some of the illustrations I use. So I look out there for some gray hair so I can use this illustration. <laughs> and that was what was going on when I got saved. Hippies can't know the Lord. They can't know God. Their hair's too long. They, they don't wear shoes. They can't possibly know God. Look at the way they are. I was talking yesterday to, to Chuck and Kay Smith. We were at the pastor's conference, and, and, uh, and Marie was there for a meeting. She's, um, she meets with Kay and all, and, and we were at the pastor's conference, and so my wife and I and, and Chuck and Kay and some others were at a table visiting and all, and and we were, we were talking about um, the old, old days in the, in the movement and all, and, and a young man comes walking up. This young guy is maybe 21 or 22 years old, and he's wearing puka shells. You guys know what puka shells are? Good, I got some too. Uh, puka shells. And I look at him, and I say, you, you're, wearing your puka, you're wearing your shells, huh? And he goes, yeah. And I said, my wife, Marie, hated my shells. She hated, my wife Marie hated me. I had this, when I met her, I thought I was so cool. You know, and I had my, my Maranatha dove and I had the shells and, and it was like her life's quest for me to stop wearing those. And so I said, you know, and Marie goes, oh yeah, I thought he looked so goofy with those. I didn't like them. And Kay said, where did you buy them? And I said, well, I actually, I made them. You know, you used to go to these little shops and you'd buy these little shells and you'd get some dental floss and you'd tie it up. And, and I said, and that's what I did. And so we were kind of laughing about that. And, and Kay says, you know, I can still remember I can still, and she's going to turn 80 years old this month. She says, I can still remember when we would go out there in Huntington Beach, Chuck and I, and we would see the hippie kids, and they would walk past, and I would cry. And we would pray for these hippies that God would touch them. And, and you know how it is in the Calvary Ministries. A lot of the hippies that, that Kay and Chuck would pray for are now not just pastoring, but pastoring blessed churches. Some of the largest churches in the United States are being pastored by hippie kids that Kay used to pray for. But, but the church at that time, the church, uh -uh, the, the normal, you know, church, uh -uh. If, if you come in here and you're barefooted, we don't want you in here. I can still remember the story of, because uh, we would go barefooted. I went to church barefooted all the time, didn't wear shoes. I would wear slacks and a shirt, a dress shirt, and I'd go barefooted. I mean, it, that's just the way it was. I still, to this day, I wear shoes, if you don't mind me telling you, twice a week. That's it, man. You know, I wear flip-flops, you know, because I, just, I, I don't remember, you know, I've been wearing flip-flops for 40-some years, you know. I just, I, anyway. Uh, so if we, if, we, if we came walking in, which we did, you know, we would come barefooted just constantly. And there was a time when some of the guys there at, at Calvary Costa Mesa put up a sign that said, uh, no shoes, no entrance. And because the hippies were coming in and they had just put new carpet in and um, they were going to bring their, their greasy feet that were, you know, filled with dirt and all and dirty up our carpets. And so they put up a sign, no, no, no shoes and uh, no entrance. But Chuck, the pastor, had gotten there early and, and he found the sign and he took it down. And, and he called the guys over and he said, if, if a new carpet keeps a single kid from coming in here, let's rip out the carpet and just have concrete floors because we're not going to keep kids from coming to Christ. Listen, that's what I was raised with because that's Christian, you see. But today, we have to be very careful that we don't kind of just bring it up to the 21st century and say, they got piercings. They can't possibly know Jesus. They got tattoos. Oh, my God, the Antichrist. They have got to be Antichrist. <laughs> You know, because be careful, be careful, be careful. Because if some kid sits next to you with these, his hair all odd or, or her, her, you know, earrings everywhere, you know. Um, and and, and I, 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 I happen to, you know, I happen to love those kids, you know, frankly. Because they're kids that when God gets hold of their heart, man, they're not afraid of anything. You know, you know, part of the reason why we, we who were hippie kids, you know, we were so used by God is we, we didn't care. So you didn't like me, so what? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? That's part of the reason. That's, that's, so what? I'll tell you about the Lord. I hate you. Yeah, I know that already, but let me tell you about Jesus, you know. <laughs> I mean, 
so that, that was just the truth. That, I mean, that barrier was already dealt with because we were already disliked. And so what's one, one more thing? And anyway, if you, if you want to hate me for loving you, that's, that's okay. That's, that's how it works. May this congregation not become old wineskins. May we not fall into that trap of judging on outer appearances. Because, you know what, I'm not going to mark my body up like some of these kids do, you know. I'm not going to do that. That's not my thing, you know. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to throw a bunch of spikes in my head, you know, and, and all of that, you know. That's not my thing. But when I see those kids talking to other kids that look just like them, what's the difference between that and when I, as a long hair, would speak to other long hairs? What's the difference? They're trying to reach their own kids who relate to them, who won't listen to some old goof like me, who may listen to this kid. Because you look at him and you say, well, you're like me, but there's something different about you. And I, I learned a long time ago that the Lord has a way of cleaning up the fish after he catches it. We're so busy saying, oh, here comes a, a fish we need to clean up. Here, take those things out. Oh, metal detectors, bing, bing, bing. Let's get all that off of them. No, no. And so the Bible is very clear. The Lord doesn't look at things like man looks at because man looks at the outer appearance, but God, well, God looks at the heart. And, and so that's why Jesus is speaking to him. That's why he gives to him this, this, uh, this story here. And, and, and he's, he's making it very, very uh, clear that uh, in this story that uh, neither one of these people had money to pay the debt. Notice one owes 500 denarii, the other 50, but he says, uh, when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Neither one of them had enough money to pay the debt. So neither the self-righteous Pharisee nor this sin-bound woman have the ability to pay the debt. And then, in verse 44, now this to me is very, very important, because this is something you can miss. He turned to the woman... But he says to Simon, do you see this woman? I underscore that. That's a great question. Do you see this woman? The answer is no. I, I don't see a woman to be crass, if I may, for a moment. All Simon sees is a prostitute. I don't see, a, no, I don't see a person. I don't see a little girl who was born like other little girls in a society that valued marriage and fidelity over a lifetime. No, I don't see a girl whose whole life was given over to the hope of one day marrying somebody and bearing children and being the most valuable person society has, which is a mother raising a godly generation. Simon didn't see that. All Simon saw was a whore. That's all he saw. And that's why Jesus has to say, do you see her? Have you looked at her? Listen, every person in this room has a testimony, and, and if we were to actually say what our real testimony was, we might scare the person next to us. What we really were, and what we could really be if Jesus hadn't come into our life. We could scare the person next to us, because we only give the sanitized versions of what we were really like. We only say the things that are acceptable in public because we don't want people to know what we thought just yesterday or last night or just a moment ago. We don't want people to know what our heart's really like. And so what we have a tendency of doing is looking on the outer appearance. Are they clean? Do they smell okay? You know, then I'll talk to them. They're all right. But we stopped looking into people's eyes a long time ago. And so, Simon, you're not a very good judge of character because you're not even looking at this woman you're not even really looking at her. You don't understand what her life has been all about. You don't know what it was like for her to be used. You don't know what it was like for her to be hurt. You don't know what moved her into the lifestyle that she has. All you can see is that she's not like you. And as a result of that, you think I'm bad for loving her. You think I'm bad for loving her. That amazes me. If we're ever going to be used by the Lord, we have to look at people. We have to learn to look at one another. 
And, and, and we have to realize that they all have stories, every one of us do. So he says, you see this woman. I, and by the way, he's saying this in front of everybody because it's, it's just absolutely stone silent. And so he's actually dressing down Simon in front of witnesses. And he goes on, I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her, her head. You gave me no kiss. This woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil. This woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. The three basic common courtesies that are extended from er by every host to their guest, you didn't show me any of those. I walk dusty roads. I come in with dusty feet. Normally a servant will wash the feet of a, a guest. You didn't do that. You didn't give me a kiss of greeting. This woman kissed my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil because it's hot. And it's just an, another custom showing graciousness. But she anointed my feet with fragrant oil. The things that you refused to do, even though you were basically culturally obligated to, to do so because that's a sign of a good host, but because you disdained me, because you didn't respect me, because you were looking for something that you could find wrong with me, so you didn't extend any of those common courtesies to me, the things that you did for other people you didn't do for me, well, look what she did for me. And you want to talk about love? You want to talk about forgiveness? You see, when Simon said in verse 43 at the question, which of them will love him more, found in verse 42, and he said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Again, that I suppose is another contemptible response. It's a disrespectful thing. It's another way of saying it's quite obvious. But Jesus uses that because he wants to demonstrate that Simon and this woman both needed a Savior. And that's why he says in verse 47, Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. Uh, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. I asked the Lord a long time ago to please help me never forget, never to go back and never to long for, but help me never to forget what my life was like without him. Help me never to forget that. I, I, I am afraid. I, I do not want to get to the point where I can actually say, I don't understand how they could do that. I don't want to get there. I don't ever want to be able to say, I don't understand how you could do that. Because, because without Christ, I could do pretty much anything that's wrong. I need him. I need his restraining power. I need his, him in my life. And, you see, and I, I, I don't want to go there. But years ago, I can still remember how um, I was around Christians. I was going to Bible college, and I was fellowshipping in a church. It wasn't a Calvary Chapel ministry. It was a different church. And, and, and I sensed there's something missing in my group of friends, and, and I started getting to the point where I, 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 I just, there's something missing here. And, 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 and I, I believe very strongly that I can be impacted by my friendships. And I started seeing the flame that I at one time had burning in my heart. I saw it starting to go out, and I started getting concerned about it. And, and I, I didn't know what it was until it finally hit me. It finally hit me. The friends that I had, and they're good friends, by the way, and I loved them very much. And I'm not knocking my friends. I loved them. But I was wondering what was happening to me. And... Uh, I noticed they didn't ever share their faith. Uh, I noticed that they were people who were starting to experiment with drinking and stuff, things that I had been pulled out of a long time before. And now they're going out wanting to drink their beers because they turned 21, and, and, and we can drink. You know, God's grace is sufficient. And, and, and for me, I couldn't do that because I had spent years doing that already, and I thought it was a wasted life. And finally, this, this is the passage that the Lord used in my life. To, to, to give me an understanding. The way that Jesus said, to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. You see, Simon didn't realize how much he needed forgiveness. He didn't have a conscious need for it. And therefore, he didn't have love. And therefore, received no forgiveness because his self-evaluation precluded him from recognizing a need for forgiveness. And his indifference to Jesus demonstrated that there was no love of God in him. Because the Bible says he who does not love doesn't know God, for God is love. He didn't know the Lord. He was just religious. 
And I, I prayed as I was putting this study together that we as a fellowship will not become a church that forgets where we came from. You see, Jesus forgave her of sins. That's what it says in verse 48. Your sins are forgiven. Now, when he says your sins are forgiven, your sins have already been forgiven. It would give us to a belief that she had already had that forgiveness. It had already entered in by faith, and Jesus is just confirming that. But there are people who sat at the table, and they begin to say, who is this who even forgives sins? What kind of man is this? Who is this? Well, the answer is this is the one who can forgive sins, and that's why he says your faith has saved you. Go in peace. My wife and I were listening to a song by Casting Crown, uh, Casting Crowns today. It's Does Anybody Hear Her? I'm sure you've heard this song. And the words, does anybody hear her? Can anybody see? Or does anybody even know she's going down today under the shadow of our steeple with all the lost and lonely people searching for the hope that's tucked away in you and me? Does anybody hear her? Can anybody see? She's yearning for shelter and affection that she never found at home. She's searching for a hero to ride in, to ride in and save the day. And in walks her Prince Charming, and he knows just what to say. Momentary lapse of reason, and she gives herself away. If judgment looms under every steeple, if lofty glances from lofty people can't see, can't see past her scarlet letter, and we never even met her. I was talking to Marie today about that song because we heard it, and I said this to her, and I'll repeat it out loud to you. I said, that's not true with our fellowship. That's not true with our church. I said, I actually have a problem with this song because our church isn't that way, and I don't know any churches that are. Because I honestly believe that if we have people coming in here who are broken, that you would love them. I believe that. I believe you would accept them. I believe you'd put your arm around them and minister to them. I've seen it. I know you will. But may we always do that. May we never get like a Simon. And we start just seeing the outer appearance and don't see the hearts. May we never be like that. May we, may we always remember where we came from and what we were saved out of and what we would be without him. And, and may, as we draw closer to the Lord, may we see more and more of his wonderful, merciful, compassionate love and our unworthiness. Because if I can see how unworthy I am of his love, then I'll serve him all the days of my life, not expecting anything. Because that's what I was saved to do, is to serve him, because he laid down his life for me. And I will serve him gladly because I keep remembering what I was without him. But I also see what I've become because of him.